Unity Live is dedicated to unity consciousness and the ascension of all beings. I'm Emily Ghosh Harris. I'm Brooklyn Rain. And we are the co-creators of Unity Live. And today we have such a special guest today. Aaron Abke is joining us today. Aaron is a unity consciousness and law of one teacher. There are many, many, many things that I can say about Aaron, um, but one that stands out is really how uh, beautifully he is of service to humanity. And he has an incredible YouTube channel with millions of views. And one thing that I think uh, you know everybody would agree about uh, his YouTube channel is the fact that it is so easy to binge watch <laughs> and spend, you know, a multitude of time, um, you know, uh, diving into episodes and also um, his ability to really break down complex spiritual teachings into simple terms. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back with you. Yes. And we have lots to dive into, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to talk about um, is, is the law of one. And I recently mm -hmm. came across um, the raw material um, and it's profound, nice. <laughs> <laughs> such an activating book. And, you know, it, yeah. it, it, um, it really feels simple yet profound in, in the sense that it really meets us kind of where we are. I imagine, you know, you've done so much exploration into the teachings and I'm sure, you know, every time it's a little bit, you know, different and there's more to uncover. And, you know, one of the things that we would love to ask you about is just given the nature of the times right now and everything that we were talking about, the collective energies and, you know, so much that's happening in our world right now, um, how are you, you know, finding that material and are you reading visiting it in, in a different way. Yeah, I love this question because the law of one has absolutely come to life for me in a brand new way through this whole pandemic era. Um, and probably the most notable way that it's come alive is in understanding how polarity works. Because when I was studying the law of one, I've, I think I've listened to it through eight times now. So let's say the first like four times through five times through, um, I couldn't really connect with the whole idea of the service to self path. Like I acknowledged that it was true and it, it made sense, but like, I don't know what that would even be like to be service to self. Um, so like a lot of what Ra would say about the negative polarity, I'll go, okay, you know, mental note taken, but I didn't have any like experiential nexus for it, but I understood it conceptually enough to where once this whole pandemic era started rolling out and we started to see a lot of these service to self strategies being used um, by the government, by the media, by regulatory bodies, medical industry, just everywhere we're being inundated with all the classic examples Ra gives of how the negative path takes control through very clever deceit and like false light and things like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, I see it now. I understand how the negative polarity works. It makes perfect sense that in the same way that the positive polarity polarizes by honoring free will and protecting free will, uh, the negative path polarizes by capturing free will and manipulating free will. Uh, the, the two polarities have to be perfect opposites to one another, right? So all that to say, um, my perspective and awareness of this whole sort of a great reset, great awakening we're seeing happen on our planet has also shifted dramatically from, you know, the first year, year and a half ish. It's a lot of stress, um, anxiety, a little bit of fear comes up a lot of anger about the injustices. And because of the law of one understanding how our planet is moving into the next density, right? We, when we move into the next density, the planet has to draw a very harsh line between the positive and the negative polarity because we're the planet is literally choosing which polarity it wants to be. And so it has to make this really like sort of like in the Bible, separating the wheat from the chaff or the sheep from the goats. You know, Jesus gave all those parables. Um, it's funny because Jesus even called it the harvest in the passage. Jesus said, you know, the, the harvest is drawing near. 
Um, but the, the workers, the laborers are very few. And that's echoed in Ra's teaching so many times where Ra says, you will have a harvest into the fourth density, but um, there, it will not be a great harvest because your planet's very mixed. And so the way that it works is that it's the way it works with anything, really, whether it's religion or old systems, old ideologies, they sort of just die off with time, right? As each successive generation just resonates less and less with the old model and seeks for something new and more free and more, more true to who they are, we outgrow the old belief system. So our planet will slowly continue to outgrow all of these service to self forms of control and enslavement and um, infringing on free will. It just isn't going to resonate with our with our collective for very much longer. So my perspective of what's happening now has shifted from the stress, anger, fear reactions to very much like excitement. When you know you can take the aerial view that the law of one provides really well of what's happening metaphysically in our planet and say, wow, actually everything is happening according to plan. You know, the earth has to do some really deep shadow work to purge these forms of darkness from our collective because as we know, there's been a whole lot of really nasty and evil injustices humans have committed on one another for thousands of years. So we're kind of seeing that being healed as we want justice, we want freedom, we want righteousness. And we're seeing this uprising now. And I don't know about you guys, but it feels very much like the pendulum is starting to swing back where people are getting bolder to stand up for freedom and righteousness and justice and standing against a lot of the, the mandates and the control. So I'm, I'm growing more and more excited and happy about what I'm seeing because when you understand how polarity works, you just understand like we don't make real changes unless we're met with a catalyst, unless we have a challenge to overcome. And it's like, hey, if this is the challenge we need to like wake up guys, you're allowing your whole planet to be enslaved by wealthy elites who don't have the planet's best interest in mind. When we wake up to that collectively and say, ah, we're going to say no to that, then, it, then it's over, right? Because we have all of the power as soon as we wake up to who we are and become unified. Yeah, well said. So I know I can feel and sense um, uh, some of the uh, telepathic chatter that's taking place here with, the, <laughs> with our <laughs> audience. Um, you know, what, what are some of the ways in which um, in this particular now moment and all of that's taking place, um, you know, how can, from your experience and, and the way, you know, what comes through you and sharing, what are some of the best ways to be able to um, really kind of tap into our own unique expression and blueprint of what we're meant to do in the flow of all mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's happening and taking place? Yeah, I, lo I love the way you phrased that because in your question, I think is the is my answer, which is that we have to start, we just have to start being true to who we are and finding our unique soul's expression and then just following it with all of the passion and faith that we can muster. Um, I'm very passionate about talking about how we move to an enlightened civilization. I just, I could talk about this forever because all the potential is right here. Like we have the technology, we have the means, we have the ability to communicate with each other to make a truly enlightened world if we all want that and know what that looks like and say yes to it and begin creating it. And so I think as we do that, it's gonna look like little pockets of parts of the world that understand, okay, the old system is out there. It's still running, you know, tyrannical governments controlling countries all around the world. That's okay. We can't change that system from inside of it. We can just refuse to participate in it any longer and make our own world, right? So we've seen like a lot of these mandates are bringing about a lot of really great change. Um, one example being like, I grew up in California, born and raised, and um, they just instituted like mandatory vaccinations for like five years old through um, through high school, right? For, for all children, if you want to go to school and parents are just outraged and there's this huge upset in California, but then the, re the response is, well, then let's just make our own schools. And I'm like, yes, that's how an enlightened civilization has to think. Right. And when we start opening the pathways for everyone to find where they fit into that society, that enlightened civilization, we will make a world where everyone gets to do what they're passionate about and make a living off of it and thrive in it 
because as more and more needs arise in a society, like, hey, we need better education systems, people who are passionate about that will start rising up and filling those gaps, whether it's technology or medicine or any industry you could name, as those needs arise, when we have a community of people who say, we're all in this for the greater good of all of us, like service to others, that's our orientation, then we will naturally fill those roles with our passion. Because even, even our passion is given to us by the universe. It's like, you, in a sense, me, the person, the individual doesn't even choose my passion. The passion chooses me. The passion is that divine energy that wants to express itself through somebody. And so for me, it's chosen to express the desire to teach and communicate higher knowledge, let's say. For you guys, it's to, it wants to express having a platform to communicate with people about unity consciousness and medicine and education and on and on and on. So I think we have to start finding our passion and stop feeling like we have no choice but to be enslaved to a job or a system we don't really like because we got to earn a paycheck. It's like, that's such a lack mentality, right? That we have to let go of and understand that the universe is pure abundance. It will have your back no matter what you want to do. If you have faith and trust in it, like the universe will make a way. And I think that really is the bridge to an enlightened civilization. Love that. So you, beautiful. You've touched on like some of my favorite spiritual mantras, <laughs> faith, nice. trust, and surrender, right? Is that the foundation of, you know, foundational building blocks of everything that's moving in way of, of love one. So yeah, um, beautifully said, thank you. Yeah. And I see, and I feel the world that you're talking about and where everybody is able to contribute, you know, their own unique gifts and talents and really be of service in a variety of different ways. And so I'd love to talk to you about that because, you know, Ra talks about sort of the preparation of being in service to others and that at being a really important distinction in terms of raising consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a hugely important distinction because we still live in a world that says, look out for number one, you know, self-survival. Like we saw that with the, the toilet paper shortages and the food shortages, like that's still the, the fear, the fear-based reactions. I still haven't been healed in us, which is why I say every world problem we're seeing right now, they're all just actually spiritual problems, right? They're problems that exist within us that we haven't healed yet. And so they have the capacity to keep manifesting in the collective. There's enough energy going in that direction of greed or selfishness that the, that, that energy has to express somewhere. Right. And so this is where projection and healing becomes so important because what, what we're actually doing in our world right now, to a large extent um, for the segment of the population that just can't accept or believe what's really happening behind the curtain, it's because we're still projecting our denial onto the world. Meaning if I haven't really looked inside of myself and really met that part of me, that's greedy, you know, that wants to get one over on somebody and maybe um, wants to round down on the tip and all these things. If I haven't really met that greedy aspect of my ego and, and met it with love and forgiveness and healed it, then I won't be able to believe that wealthy elites could be so greedy to do these horrible things to people because I'm denying it in myself. Well, I'm a good person. I would never do that. So they would never do that. But when you see it in yourself, your eyes and your discernment become razor sharp to see it in the world. But your response when you see it isn't anger and rage and injustice and whatever. It's very much like, okay, there's something that needs to be healed. So we, we got to get to work, right? So the service to others model is the opposite of the lookout for number one. It's like, hey, we don't have to feel afraid anymore about whatever happens in the world because we're all in this together. Let's link hands. We'll have each other's best interest in mind. And surely with enough of us, there's nothing we can't do, right? So the service to others model will eventually rid our world of fear and fear-based reactions to any of the calamities we see, whether it's natural disasters, or economic crashes. We won't live in the fight or flight mode any longer. Once we know that we all have each other's backs and one more perfect example of this is um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the farming crisis happening right now, but a lot of farmers are coming out on the internet and YouTube and social media saying like, Hey, we're all being told by the federal government to destroy our crops. And if we don't, they're going to get rid of our, um, our subsidies and all these things. 
So they're, they're paying us one and a half times what our farm is worth to destroy our crops because they want to have a monopoly on where food comes from and all that and the distribution. So local farmers, they're trying to put them out of business. And it's like, that's not a problem with unity consciousness, right? Because we just say, hey, don't worry about it. We are glad to pay you great money for your crops. We don't need the government. You don't need their subsidies. You don't need to rely on them. We can rely on one another and we can build the world that we want. And I just think that's so beautiful. It really is. Aaron, what are some other ways that service to self strategies can be somehow, you know, woven in? So like the strategies we kind of see happening now. Yeah. Well, I think when it comes to service to self strategies, I'm actually releasing a video tomorrow called false light that details this um, really deeply, but the basic strategy of the service to self path as raw lays it out in the law of one is that um, we, we tend to think about the negative polarity, like, you know, Darth Vader is going to stroll in or some kind of mustache twirling villain, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's absolutely not how the negative polarity shows up. They show up more like the Gavin Newsom's like really well-dressed, handsome, slicked back hair. They know great smile. They know how to talk. They know how to say all the things you want to hear. And so if you don't have a really sharp discernment and wisdom to pick up where they're asking you to betray your integrity or, or they're making some sort of bargain, like, um, like we see like mandates, right? We're giving you a free choice and they'll always present it like that. But of course, it's not a free choice because at one end is an ultimatum a punishment or a consequence, it's, it's very much like a narcissistic abuser in a relationship will be. It's like, um, I'm doing this because I love you, right? Or um, you're not allowed to go out with your friends anymore without me because I want to protect you. I need to know you're safe, <laughs> right? No more single nights with your girlfriends anymore. Um, and the, the narcissistic abuser will take more and more freedom away from her life and put it into his hands, but he will always paint it as love or I, I care. It's a virtuous reason. So we have to know what the light is first and foremost. If we're going to detect false light, we have to know real light, which light in this analogy is love, right? Love knows no bargaining. Love knows no reward. It's not going to ask you to do anything to get something out of it. It cares only for you, only to be of service. And so if there's any ultimatum involved at all, if the choices presented have any kind of contingency at all, if you're being asked in any way to violate your own free will or integrity, if you're being asked to see yourself as a victim to something, these are all attributes of false light. So they'll dress it up with nice sounding words, but if you can detect those things, victimization, denying your integrity, bargaining for freedom, then you know it's coming from false light, plain and simple. Yeah, we're, we, uh, we've had, we have a lot to uh, sort through. <laughs> <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, and that system and that system? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oops. Right. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, but the beautiful thing that Ra explains in the law of one about the negative polarity is that this is why we can't have any judgment. We can't make the government an enemy or anyone an enemy because it's not as if the way that our mind paints it when we see these like corrupt leaders and politicians is, oh, look at this evil person that rose to power. And it's actually not like that. Ra explains that power by virtue of what it is automatically will polarize you to the negative. In the same way that experiencing love will automatically polarize you to the positive. Like we've all seen movies or, or stories where um, the villain in the story maybe like meets a little child or some innocent animal or character that slowly makes the villain more pure over time because it learns to love something. So it's polarizing the bad guy to the positive. And then at the end of the movie, the villain has this reconciliation, becomes the good guy. Lots of movies like with that storyline. It's the same on the opposite end of the spectrum where you can be a you know, good person with great intentions. I want to go into politics to help people. And then as more lobbyists come your way and more millions and millions and eventually billions, and you realize I have done enough wealth and power to control entire institutions and make them do whatever I want. It gives the ego so much more leverage over your mind and it will automatically polarize that person to the negative. So it's actually not that evil people rise to power. 
and if we use evil as a misnomer, but it's that power makes people evil. So it's like, I can't judge them for that because who knows if I found myself with that level of wealth and power, if I wouldn't be doing the same things, we only have to refuse to participate in those systems and just create a new world. I think that's such an important distinction because right now there is so much power and weight on those systems. And as we, you know, shift our energy away, that starts to dissipate. And and you're right, you know, so many people go into politics with really positive intentions. Yeah. But the system itself, to your point, is built on matrices of, you know, uh, and entanglements of such false light that, you know, it's like you're walking into something that's already completely constructed at its, you know, at its roots um, in, right. in that sort of false light, in that darkness, in that sort of magnetizing, sort of sucking you into the vortex. And so one thing I, I, I keep hearing coming over and over again, because you've obviously, you know, are able to um, really find your center point. Like as I'm looking at your energy and I mean, you're just, you're there. Like there's no wavering from that, right? So, you know, what would you offer to those listening um, in way of how you made it to that place of just always dialing into, Mm -hmm. you know, that zero point of your own source connection, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is the most important question right now. Um, I put a post on my story, I think yesterday about this exact subject where I was just saying, like, we have to remember that the most important thing any of us can be doing right now is just to work on ourselves and expand our consciousness and heal. Because each one of us that heals our greed, let's say we, we take a little more greed out of the collective consciousness, which means that the greedy world leaders are going to get less and less greedy over time because they are a manifestation of us, right? It's the collective consciousness is like the soil that everything grows in. So if we want no more greed to manifest in our governments and systems and institutions, we have to get it out of the soil, which is you and me. So it's like, take, take this time to just take radical ownership of your own growth and make it the most important thing in your life, right? To expand my consciousness, to become more aware of my blind spots, to heal my traumas, uh, to forgive those who uh, have hurt me in the past. And as each one of us raises our own vibration, you know, it creates the snowball effect where the more, the higher the frequency of the collective gets, the more accessible it gets for other people to start awakening all around the world, just by nature of the frequency. And Ra talks about this in the fifth density of consciousness, uh, fifth density beings being in the wisdom density. Apparently um, that's their form of service is expanding their psychic capacity and expanding their consciousness and connectedness with creation. They know that by actually just making my own consciousness as polarized as possible, that's the greatest assistance I can be to this planet or to any planet I'm on. And so if we take that same approach, I think we'll see so much good coming out of it so much more so than because I'm all about like, yes, we need to bring awareness to the corruption in the world and we need to see what needs to be healed in the world. But if we don't heal these things in ourselves, another corrupt politician will take his place. Another wealthy elite will take their place. We're just going to keep replacing the same characters because they're just manifestations of the energy in us. Right? So I love how the law of one says, you know, the best things you can do is number one, as you gaze in the mirror, behold the creator, see yourself, know yourself as the source in human form. And that in and of itself opens the heart chakra, allows you to feel more connected with everything. But second step Ra says is look at the other selves and see the creator as well. So stop seeing other people as outside of me and separate from me. Just see everyone as that one great energy expressing itself. And that one energy is love. But the degree to which we are ignorant of that energy, that divinity in all of us, it becomes negatively polarized and we get all the corruption and the evil. So it's not that they're, it's their fault that they're that way. They don't know who they are. And so we can't blame them, right? It's up to us to shine that light, to know who I am, which then makes me sort of by virtue of my own energy, I become a teacher of that to anyone who interacts with me. They, they contact a, a bit of the divine that starts to wake up 
that consciousness in themselves, right? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. As you're um, sharing, I'm seeing um, Yeshua coming through and, you know, and almost like overlaying and mirroring, you know, bringing through biblical um, verses, et cetera, to, you know, which just goes to show the, the level of resonance and um, sort of uh, full scope of Christ consciousness, you know, that universal Christ consciousness that flows through these teachings. Um, yeah. It's just, it's really beautiful and profound. Yeah, it is. And, you know, Ra talks about, I think, know yourself, accept thyself and know yourself as the creator. And I think yeah. that really powerfully, beautifully mirrors our journey of self-love and accepting every single part of ourselves. And, you know, one of the, the videos that I've seen of, of you is really talking about some of the ways that, you know, our self, we talk about self-love or self-help in sort of, um, you know, confusing terms of, you know, mm -hmm how would you describe, you know, especially from a personal perspective, what has been helpful for you to even, you know, deepen that connection to seeing yourself as a creator? Hmm. Well, you know, I've been talking a lot about the idea of choosing your state of being lately and what that means to do that. What does it mean to choose peace? Cause it's like, you know, try to choose peace with effort, like see what happens. Right? I'm going to, be peaceful. Okay, here I go. Like, it's sort of a nonsensical thing to tell somebody, right? Choose peace. It's like you actually don't and can't choose your natural state. You're already that at the core, at the bottom most level of your being, that is your abiding state already. The problem is you've loaded a bunch of unpeaceful things on top of that. So this is, you know, the foundation of all alchemy is the knowledge that everything I want and need is already inside of me. I just have to remove whatever's not in harmony, in resonance with that vibration. So for me, choosing my state of being is about becoming very aware of what doesn't reflect peace, what isn't in alignment with peace. And that's, I think, the first step Ra gives that you just said, Emily. Uh, step number one, they call these the disciplines of the personality, three steps. Know yourself, which means self-awareness, right? Get to know what's inside of, of this mind, of this body, of this energy system. And uh, once you become aware of it, then you can go to step two, which is to accept yourself, or it could be synonymous with forgive yourself, right? Uh, I think Ross says a really amazing passage is um, you have to know yourself as the creator of the universe and simultaneously as a being on an evolutionary journey, who's learning through trial and error and making mistakes and learning and growing, you have to actually hold those two in equal measure. And then Ross says, and resting in this balanced awareness, uh, realization of the one takes place. So it's not that we deny the human side of us. It's just that we see it as, it's, as it truly is from heaven's eyes, let's say which is it's just a teaching tool. It's not ultimately what I am, but it is what the source is doing right now. Source is experiencing itself as this Aaron character. And there's a lot of divinity in that. There's a lot of beauty in that. It's not to be denied as wrong or bad. It's just not all that I am. I have to know both, both aspects, right? And I think that speaks to the polarity in a sense. You got to balance the positive and the negative within you. And then once you've balanced it within you, you've transcended both, mm. right? And that's, that's the spiritual path is of, of self-realization is knowing that everything is inside of me. Everything in the universe is, and even Ross says this, you are the microcosm of the macrocosm. You are a miniature version of this universe you see outside of you. Even our seven chakras uh, are correlated, as you know, to the seven densities, so it's like the seven densities of consciousness are kind of like the chakras of the universe. And we have those chakras in our bodies. So we are a perfect mirror of the universe, which means the dark and the light, all of it is inside of me. And until I meet it all with love, um, I can't actually realize my true potential in this life. Yeah. So beautiful. One thing I want to share that I thought was kind of fun is that when you were talking about 
you know, humanity being the soil, right? We, we're plant, you know, we're nourishing the seeds of consciousness that evolve into and express themselves in the collective consciousness. Um, one thing that was really fun for those of you who know that I'm, you know, kind of a, a bio microbiome dork is that, um, you know, they were showing us we're the microbiota, right? So it's just as, you know, the bacteria is the microcosm of our macrocosm, you know, yeah. we too can kind of consider ourselves that in the expression that you brought forth. And I just wanted to share that because I thought it was fun. <laughs> no, I love that. It's, you see that fractal nature, right? Of the universe everywhere. I've heard also people say like, we're like the cells of the universe, right? Flowing through the blood vessels or whatever. It, it's very true that as we, as you zoom out in the universe, whether you see galaxies and planets and stars orbiting around each other, or you zoom in and you see the quantum level of uh, protons and electrons orbiting around each other. It really is all the same thing, just at different densities. Yeah, absolutely. I know we have a lot of questions. Um, you've really sparked a lot of excitement uh, <laughs> today for, for those who are joining us. Um, one question that came in in advance, are you okay with taking questions? Yeah, I'd love ask? to. Okay. Um, uh, there's uh, someone who asks, um, they're creating a conscious community and farmland outside of, um, of an urban area. And they're in mm. sort of the beginning stages of this and wondered if there's anything just, you know, right off the bat that you can offer in way of advice for, um, you know, how to flow into this with the greatest uh, frequencies mm. of law of one. Yeah. Well, first of all, I love that. I always love hearing this. And people are making their own communities and, and systems. Um, you know, I would say that if you're starting your own community, which is something I plan on doing in the future as well, I think it's important to um, get connected with the area you're in, whether that's, whether that's going door to door and just saying hi to people and letting them know what you're doing or, or posting flyers or whatever, but like put the call out, right? And especially right now, we're, we're really in the midst of an incredible awakening and people are starting to notice the the, the polarities, right? Even people that wouldn't consider themselves spiritual, you know, they might call it tyranny versus freedom, but that's negative and positive, right? That's the negative and positive polarity. So call it whatever you want. People are waking up to it. And so you want to put out the call to people who are going to say yes to freedom, right? Who want to be involved in that. And that's how these communities will thrive and flourish is that the more people who buy into that message, who are polarized, service to others, uh, will get really excited about joining your community. I've even been going down to the a local farmer's market for a few months because I love, it's like such a joy to go out and support people in my community who are growing their own produce, making their own like nut butters and jams and all these cool things. And it's like every dollar I spend there, it feels like it comes back to me or something. Cause, cause it's like, you're helping, you're giving me value. I'm so happy to pay you for the value you're giving out. That's the, the, the sort of hallmark sign of the service to others path is that it's giving and receiving are the same on that path. It's a win-win situation every time. Whereas on the negative path, it's the opposite. You have to take to get, and when one person wins, another person loses. So, um, I would say reach out to your community in whatever way you can and get the message out of, hey, this is what we're building and just allow the universe to begin drawing the right sheep to that flock as it will. Beautiful. Yeah, well said. And I love that. I, I, you know, there was so much um, uh, power that came through. I was, you know, envisioning this person like going and knocking on the door. Like, first of all, that in and of itself is like an opportunity to break someone out of this, you know, yeah. pattern because you know, people have gotten so out of touch with even going and communicating with neighbors or feeling like it's, you know, it's like become so, um, right. so much so that there's like that, there's not that connection. There's not that personal connection. So yeah, so many we've been taught things. to be afraid of each other. Yeah. 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 Aaron, another question that came through, and I have to, you know, chuckle a little bit. I have not heard you answer this this question before. Um, it is that has there ever been, you know, an obstacle on your your spiritual path to look so attractive? Meaning, 
is <laughs> is that how they phrased it actually so beautiful <laughs> Um, meaning, is there an oh, nice. ego or a pride that comes from looking so handsome? Or do you ever, um, yes, that's basically the question. Yeah, this is a, it's such a funny question, actually, because um, I do get this question every so often, more so on like Instagram, people will ask, um, like, if you're, if you're so awakened, why do you want to look good? Shouldn't you just let it all go to, to hell or whatever? <laughs> <laughs> so I sometimes will joke with people like, I'm stuck like this, like, just like you are, you know, I didn't choose how I look, but, but I think, uh, I, I was so into fitness for so long, you know, 10 years of my life, I was a full-time personal trainer and fitness junkie and did fitness modeling and bodybuilding and stuff. And so I think as you condition the person, um, you get used to a certain diet, certain lifestyle, life habits. Um, when you start coming into awakening, you may notice that a lot of those things just continue and, as we awaken more to who we are, we start noticing that things just find their rightful balance and whatever doesn't serve me or just is, you know, a remnant of that old person that I'm healing from now, it just stops feeling relevant to me like bodybuilding and like fitness modeling. You know, as soon as I had my awakening experience at 27, where I really saw it, I really saw the nature of reality and who I am. I immediately quit bodybuilding and, and modeling that day. I was like, I'm done. I'm never doing it again. Cause I realized that was what my old self was doing to get approval from others and feel valuable. And I didn't need that anymore, but I kept working out. I kept exercising and, um, keeping up my physical vessel, so to speak, because when you really come into the awareness of oneness, everything has its rightful place. Uh, nothing is to be denied or rejected in that sense. Um, not the body, not the mind, not my life circumstances. In fact, as I become more expanded, you start to realize how, how connected everything is. Like, I can't, I can't really think I'm super evolved and self-realized if I'm eating a horrible diet because there's something off there, right? There's something out of balance, something's disconnected and, and it starts to show up like, okay, I'm starting to realize how when I say, oh, let me just eat a cheeseburger because it's more convenient and it tastes good. I'll eat, I'll eat healthy tomorrow. Like that urge is the same urge that shows up when that old negative thought rolls in my head. I don't want to really take responsibility for it and look at it and heal it and forgive it. It's easier to just let it slip by and dwell on it a little bit. It's the same exact mentality, isn't it? But it translates to my lifestyle and my diet and uh, my cleanliness and my mind. It's actually all one thing, right? So when I really love myself, I have to take care of this body because the body's an extension of me. It's my vehicle in this life and it, it directly determines my quality of life. And so now I, I exercise a lot less than I used to. It used to be like double days and stuff, but you know, five days a week, um, probably two or three of those days, yoga, two or three days, weight training, two or three days, cardio. And I just mix it up as it feels good. And I have no problem anymore, like listening to my body when it wants a rest day. Whereas old me was like, no, you're going to get up and get your ass in the gym and do the 45 minute Stairmaster and the two hour wait session. Cause you can't skip a session. Like that was the, the way my ego worked out before. And now I work out cause I want to bless my body and make it healthy. And so when my body's like, Hey, I'm feeling pretty beat up today. I take a rest day and don't stress about it. Whereas before it would stress me out to take a rest day. So everything changes and comes into rightful balance. I'll say, um, whether that's your diet or lifestyle, people worry that if I become enlightened, am I just going to get fat and sit on the couch? <laughs> it's like such a funny question, but the short answer is absolutely not. Yeah. I love it. Everything's in divine perfection. Right. And so yeah. um, it, it's just, there's so many uh, quantum layers um, that came in, in addition to how you answered it, which was profound and really, you know, such an invitation for, for people to really show up and see like, okay, like what patterns are playing out and why am I making these choices and, are right, these choices, right. you know, and without judgment and, you know, always. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, there's so much divine perfection in this massive time of, um, transitioning right out of, uh, the third density and into these higher levels of dimensional consciousness, et cetera. Um, you know, to come in and to have chosen your physical structure as you have makes so much sense, right? Because there is that crossover that's still taking place whereby, 
you know, people aren't necessarily in the early stages of their awakening or even may, maybe even further into their awakening, necessarily connecting with the core essence of another being um, in such a way of pure heart connection, they have to use their technology of their eyes to, you know, to continue to feel right. their way through and to, and, you know, and so it's, it's divinely purposed is what I'm hearing. It's like, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice job on, you know, nice, nice. Work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually a great point. Um, I do get a number of people that will say every so often, I was really grateful to find your channel because to see like a young guy who dresses like I dress and stuff and works out and is in shape to see a guy like that talking about self-realization and spiritual awakening, it, like it gave me permission. Like you don't have to be a, like a Hindu yogi with a long beard or an old white guy or something to be awakened. Um, the universe wants to break those stereotypes and realize like, no, we're not all meant to be the same and, you know, you can only be enlightened if you kind of look like Eckhart and dress like Eckhart or Byron Katie, like that's just who they are. Right. Yeah. But you have your own unique expression and none of it is going to go away when you awaken to who you are. In fact, it actually finds such more dynamic expression, but in that right, healthy balance. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Thank you. <clears throat> One question, Aaron, is just how um, do you recommend, or is there a way through, through spirit <sighs> Um, that we're able to kind of connect with each other when we're unable to do so physically. And also the second part of that question is just how to be of greatest service, both to ourselves individually and collectively at this time. Hmm. So for the first part of the question, Ra says that love is the strongest magic in the universe. And love is really the bridge to all connection of any form. Um, we have the lower three chakras, um, root, sacral, solar plexus. And then the fourth chakra is the heart, right? And then we have the three spiritual chakras, the throat, third eye, and the crown. So it's, it's very much the bridge between the physical and the metaphysical. And so Ra explains like all psychic abilities for the positive polarity, at least, begin with the foundation of love. Love is the psychic force that connects us to each other. It's where we find oneness. So if, if you and I, for example, want to communicate telepathically from my mind to your mind, we actually can't do that if we're positively polarized unless we love each other first. Right? I have to really see you as myself. And that seeing you as myself is what allows whatever it is, the quantum the, the psychic ability to connect us in the astral and we can share thoughts and minds. And then as Ra explains, that eventually becomes a social memory complex where once the whole planet has developed that ability to be psychic and communicate in thought and the whole planet loves each other, then the whole planet shares one mind called a social memory complex, which is what Ra is, right? From Venus. Mm -hmm. Venus's social memory complex is Ra. So love is the way we connect. And whether you're with that person, whether that person's passed from this life or not, you're, they're as close to you as the feeling of love you have for them. They really are. And then uh, how can we best utilize this to be of service to both ourselves and all the collective? I would just go back to what we already touched on of seeing everyone as myself and interacting with them as if they are myself. Because if you, if you actually see it, it demands your actions to follow suit, right? If I really see you as myself, then I have to have your best interest in mind equal to my own, which means I can't do anything that serves me, but puts you out. I have to, I can only do things that serve us both. Um, that's the, you know, the foundation of service to others. So first see it, see it in your heart with the, with the eyes of your heart, which we call love. And then the behaviors and actions will all follow automatically. Yeah. Love that. Interesting, as you're speaking, um, this Aboriginal collective came forth and we're showing how, you know, what you're describing really reflects in how they kind of speak to, you know, collective harmony as sort of like as of the one, right? As this amoeba almost like where everything communicates, you know, through that connection with the core essence. Yeah. Through the heart space. And um, they were kind of coming through and exemplifying that. So wanted to share that. That's beautiful. Yeah. One question that I have for you, Aaron, is, is 
You know, I know that you have been speaking about topics that um, are of great significance at, during these times, you know, especially where we see, you know, a lot of division that's playing out in our planet. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I follow you and I feel like you share with, with love and, and as a, in a way, so as not to, you know, incite fear or, you know, greater division. I, you know, I guess I'm wondering for you, was that a, a difficult decision in the beginning and um, and then also, what would you recommend to others in terms of holding that space? Mm, yeah. I think the question you're asking really gets at the core of what non-doership means. Because non-doership means there is no individual here who is choosing what they are excited about or afraid of or any of it, right? Life has conditioned this mind-body unit to desire and fear all of the things that it does. So non-doership is the beginning of accepting that fact, which is there is no separate self who's choosing anything. Life is living always, and it's always accomplishing its own will. Once I see that and believe that in my heart, then I can't say no to any desire or excitement that arises in my heart. I have to say this is life's excitement that it wants to express through me. Um, if it keeps coming back, if it's resonating powerfully with me, I just go with it because I've learned, and I could give so many examples of this by just letting myself be where I am and be in the energy that's arising, you know, as we are moving into self-realization, there's so many layers of what we are that need to be sifted through and healed. And so if you find, um, like sometimes people will say, Aaron, I've, I've been on this awakening journey and it's been going great, but then all of a sudden this desire came back to play video games all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, no, oh, I, I shouldn't play video games. I should be pursuing enlightenment. I should spend that time meditating. And I'm like, that's the doer talking right now who thinks that what's arising in me is invalid and I should do something other than what life is clearly urging me to do. So I always tell people, follow your highest excitement, follow what's resonating with you because there's something there for you. There's a lesson there for you and words don't teach life teaches. So you can deny your deep desire to play video games all you want and try to watch spiritual videos. But that part of you that needs to be seen will always be crying out until you just give it the space it wants. go play the video games, dude, do it. And maybe you'll spend three to five hours a day playing video games for a few weeks. It'll be fun. And then it'll burn itself out and you'll never play. You'll never want to play a video game again. And that has happened to me so many different times on my journey where I'm like, why is this desire to watch anime coming up? Like, I just want to binge watch anime. And uh, so I was like, well, that's what life wants me to do. So let me do it. And so I watched like, you know, four or five anime shows over all of last summer until last winter through the pandemic. And then eventually lost my desire to, but I realized it was the part of me as a kid that wasn't allowed to watch that stuff. Mm. My, you know, it was evil and stuff like that. Oh, that never got to find its expression. And let me tell you what, I had so many divine downloads watching those anime shows. I'd be writing notes on my phone. Like it, everything can teach you. Like, don't be so arrogant to think that something can't teach you. So to circle back to your question, when I find myself just incredibly passionate about speaking to some of these injustices, some of the mandates I've mentioned, like this is a clear infringement on love and I cannot stay silent. I, I lose sleep at night if I'm silent. Some people say, well, Aaron, Nisargadatta says, let it all go and just be silent. I'm like, that's great. That's where Nisargadatta was at his amazing level of realization. I'm certainly not at that level of self-mastery yet. And what Nisargadatta would never say is to be the doer of your actions and take life's, take the reins of life into your own hands and start living it how you want to do it. I mean, that was his teaching was don't be the doer, let life flow through you, let it purify you, let it purge out of you, whatever it wants to. And so I just say yes to what arises. And until this urge to stop speaking out injustices goes away, I'm just going to let it flow through me because somebody needs it. Somebody's going to benefit from it and maybe I'll benefit from it. But the point is I can't know that unless I let it express. Yeah. I love that. So important. So, so important to let life um, flow through you. I feel like one of the things that uh, my uh, 
my team of guides and high self always come in when I sort of get into that place of like, okay, you know, which way am I going? Um, it's just to kind of drop in. Um, I love connecting with, I am the will of source, you know, and just like mm -hmm. getting in the center lane, getting on the true North, like just yeah. being in the flow, like, you know, to your point, when I do that, you know, it doesn't mean I'm going to be, you know, guided into an ashram to sit there for six hours and meditation. It may be that, right. you know, I'm being called downstairs to go get on the floor and play with my children, you know, or something of this nature, which, you know, so just getting yes. in that and listening. I love that. Yeah. Really important. Thank you. Yeah. Because teachers are teaching us from their state of realization. All teachers do that. So it's like, Nizargadatta was very dismissive of the world saying like, none of it's real. It's all a dream. Forget about it. Like be the self, you know, it's like, well, that's, that's his world. That's his reality he's living in. And he's sort of showing us like, this is the place you'll get to, but he has to embody it to show it. Right. He has to be it and exude it. So he was all masters teach from their state of realization, but we have to get to that place that they're at by working through all of our um, layers of consciousness that need to be healed and seen and met within us and expressed. And so it's like, know that that is probably where we'll all get to one day if we continue down this path, but there's many steps to be taken on that direction to get there. And all of it's equally valid. Like it's, it's so arrogant for me to think I should live and think and be exactly like Ramana Maharshi when I've not anywhere close to that state of consciousness he was at, right? Let me just be with what life is showing me and bringing up in me because life is the supreme guru. Life knows exactly what I need to get to that level, but I have to say yes to it, right? So profound, thank you. That was really, I've, I've, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone express something like that. And it's, um, it's opening up, it's dropping in so many divine breadcrumbs right now. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. This has been such an amazing conversation. Um, anything else that's on your heart that, that wants to come forward and, and share? I was just thinking that same thought that these are like, these are some of the best questions I've ever been served in one interview. So really appreciate the co-creation with you guys. Yeah, our pleasure. And thank you for, uh, you know, dedicating so much of your time and energy to sharing and, and creating with us. And, uh, we look forward to all the amazing things that you continue to expand into and flow into and share through your, your amazing love frequency. So thank you. Thank you so much. And likewise to you both. Thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we love you and are so grateful to have this community of co-creation to share in the oneness. And we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. Love you all.